Good evening. My name is Sandra Fritz. I'm the chairperson of the Shoe Street School Committee. Welcome to our meeting of April 7th. Tonight's meeting is broadcast live on Selco channels 29 and 329, and it's streamed on Shoe Street Media Connections website. I'd like to thank SMC Executive Director Mark Sarah, as well as Shoe Street Public Schools IT Director Brian LaRue, who help with all of our meetings. First on the agenda is public participation. No one has asked to address the committee this evening, but if anybody wishes to do so, they can contact us at school committee at shrewsbury.k12.ma.us. Next is chairperson and members report. Does anyone have anything this evening? Nothing? Okay. Next is superintendent's report. Thank you, Ms. Fritz. Uh, for superintendent's report this evening, I'd like to recognize a longtime employee, uh, Donna Manzoli uh, was, uh, began work back uh, 33 years ago um, as a secretary at the Beale Early Childhood Center. Uh, she then moved over to the Floral Street School when it opened in 1997 and served as a um, main office secretary there. And then after uh, several years of Floral Street, she came up to the central office uh, where she has served as the uh, executive assistant uh, to the assistant superintendent role for curriculum uh, of, since then and just completed uh, 33 years in the district uh, and just retired last week. Uh, Donna is uh, one of the absolute best employees anyone ever had the privilege of working with. Uh, she's an incredibly humble person, uh, but uh, certainly uh, I think anyone who's worked with her would, would indicate that she absolutely epitomizes the kind of colleague that anyone would want to have. Uh, she is thoughtful, calm, graceful, skillful, um, incredibly helpful, uh, very supportive, and uh, uh, just super kind and just a total class act. Uh, we had an uh, opportunity, uh, people put together a nice video for her, given we couldn't do a typical retirement celebration. We hope to do that at some point uh, post-pandemic. Uh, but uh, certainly what came across is that she has done a lot of problem solving for a lot of people. She handles all of our staff's needs when it comes to their professional development records, their graduate course records. Uh, and uh, really has been an incredible support for the district, has made a real difference for our students and our staff and our families in the various roles she's played. So we wish uh, Ms. Manzoli a wonderful, happy, and healthy retirement with her family and uh, thank her for her 33 years of outstanding service to the Shrewsbury Public Schools and the town of Shrewsbury. And that is Superintendent's report this evening. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Our first time scheduled appointment this evening will be an update on the school district's response to the pandemic, as well as an update on the reopening of school. Thank you. Okay, so we'll begin uh, with our three key messages. Uh, again, the health and well-being uh, of our students, our families, and our staff uh, always being our first priority, uh, that we have worked hard, and I believe we have succeeded in developing a safe school environment for our students and staff this year that prioritizes people's well-being and also enables high levels of learning. Uh, we are operating uh, based on guidance from public health authorities uh, and uh, closely monitoring, of course, all the latest data and consulting with medical experts um, to think about what's happening both here in Shrewsbury as well as across the Commonwealth uh, as well. Uh, in terms of our most updated information, uh, it's good news. We have only had three cases to date this calendar week. Uh, we have 415 cases since the start of the school year in our hybrid model. Um, we do have one additional case traced to possible exposure in school. I'll speak to that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, we've had no remote cases uh, this past week. Uh, the data dashboard is available on our website right off of our main web uh, page. Uh, the numbers have moderated a bit. You know, we went from seven back on the week of March 7th, and we had that little uh, uptick uh, to 21 the week of the 14th, and then we've had 13 in our hybrid model each of the last uh, two weeks. Uh, so there has seems to have stabilized a bit, and that number again this week so far has been pretty low. We'll see what, how that ends up by the end of the week. This next uh, slide is what we show each meeting uh, with, from the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. Uh, the Seven-day positivity rate for Massachusetts had ticked up from 2.23% to 2.46%. Um, you can see that relative to the rest of the nation, Massachusetts continues to be in a strong position and well below the 5% uh, benchmark that Johns Hopkins sets uh, for considering things about reopening and, and whatnot in, in communities. The next slide shows Shrewsbury's uh, positive test rate. That's a 14-day benchmark. Um, this was as of the April 1st. Uh, state 
public health report on uh, the coronavirus. Um, and you can see that uh, over time from very low rates back in the fall uh, to the precipitous climb uh, in November into December and early January, uh, then the steep decline. Uh, and it's been holding steady and sort of right around the two and a half percent range in terms of positivity in Shrewsbury. As far as the ratio, uh, staff to students uh, has held remarkably steady over the course of the year and currently uh, all students and staff, including those who are in the remote program, uh, we've got a ratio of 82% to 18% students to staff in terms of our cases. In terms of a school by school count, um, these are hybrid students and staff uh, as of uh, today. Um, you can see the, the numbers uh, and you know, the larger schools have larger numbers and we do have a few more uh, older uh, students and uh, we have had more staff at those larger schools as well, of course, but you can see how that numbers play out across the, the district. Uh, the next slide shows just the past two weeks um, and uh, just to note that the y-axis is you know, up to nine cases, uh, so obviously you know, smaller, few schools that didn't have any uh, cases at all and a uh, few others that had multiple cases. In terms of uh, student cases uh, by grade, um, you can see when you do it by grade, it, it evens out a, a little bit more because obviously we're accounting for students across all of our five elementary schools and our, uh, again, it's not quite as much of a dramatic difference as it looks like when it's school by school. Um, still more cases at the high school uh, than we see in those grades than other grades, but uh, fairly even distribution uh, in the mid to 20s through the mid 30s uh, generally with our youngest students having the fewest cases. In the past two weeks, you can see, again, fairly distributed uh, across the district in, term, uh, in terms of the grade levels uh, where the, we're seeing uh, student cases. This next uh, slide shows the positive cases by week. Uh, this is a combination of all of our students, hybrid and remote, and all of our staff, hybrid and remote. Um, and you can see, uh, again, just the visual representation uh, that things had come down it ticked back up a little bit there in mid-March and have uh, declined a bit since then. And uh, so far this last week, that's a partial week, uh, but it's, a, it's so far so good, only three cases. As far as the public health report, uh, the last report that was published uh, last Thursday, April 1st, uh, was for the two weeks, March 7th through March 20th. Um, and that uh, uh, was 109 cases for Shrewsbury, 19.7 per 100,000. 2.67% uh, positivity rate and keeps Shrewsbury in the yellow zone as the state defines that. And then a reminder again that uh, what we're looking at is a multiple number of mitigation strategies, layering them on top of each other. Uh, that's, uh, that's something that we are doing as a district and continue to do, uh, which helps minimize the risk of transmission in schools, which is what we're most concerned about, of course. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was an additional case of uh, in-school transmission, or at least suspected. Uh, we will never know for sure. Uh, but based on the contact tracing, uh, there was one additional case reported last week at Oak Middle School. Uh, it was the first uh, case uh, that we've seen uh, as a potential in-school transmission since late January. Um, those statistics are still overwhelmingly that the cases that we've seen in school um, are, are not uh, due to an in-school spread. Uh, we did uh, have, uh, again, the state uh, mobile testing unit come out, uh, tested a number of individuals who may have been, who were part of the same uh, team at Oak Middle School where these cases were. Um, and I just got a text uh, a few minutes ago from Noel Freeman, our director of school nursing, that uh, all of those who were tested came back negative. In addition to that, because we're doing the pooled surveillance testing, we also have a better handle um, in you know, a general way about how much... Uh, uh, where you know, how many students in that school uh, on a regular basis over the past couple of weeks have tested negative as well. Uh, speaking of the weekly pooled testing, uh, that's now occurring at all grade levels, preschool through grade 12. Um, just in, of interest, uh, since we began in early February, starting just with staff, now we're offering to all staff and, and all students across the district. Uh, there have been uh, close to 10,000 tests uh, that have been uh, given and there have been 10 positive results, which comes out to a 0.1% positivity rate. Um, in other words, 99.9% .9 of the time uh, people have tested negative, which I hope gives a lot of reassurance to folks that there is a very limited uh, number. Um, we're still looking to get the percentage of people testing to be higher. We're gonna to continue to communicate with regard to that, 
um, especially now that we have uh, uh, more opportunities across all the grade levels and we'll, we're going to continue to communicate with our parent community uh, to try to promote that as much as we can. As far as vaccines, uh, Ms. Freeman did survey uh, the uh, staff again today. Um, as of about 4 o'clock today, there were about 700 staff who had responded. Uh, good news on this front, 48% of the staff have received their two doses of Pfizer or Moderna uh, or the one dose of Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and of those, uh, about half of them are already 14 days past uh, their second dose or their first dose of the J&J &J and are therefore considered fully vaccinated. Um, and then another 40% beyond that uh, have received their first shot of Pfizer or Moderna. Um, and another 5% uh, on top of that have their first shot scheduled. So we have a very high percentage of educators um, who are now um, either vaccinated or, or are waiting for their 14-day period after their second shot uh, or they are uh, waiting for their second shot. But uh, this is a, a good news story in terms of building confidence among the staff around uh, their the safety and, and health uh, relative to the potential uh, getting of the virus. I want to again thank our community partners, Osco Pharmacy, who uh, put together uh, an on-site clinic for us uh, uh, the week before last on a Friday um, that a number of our staff were able to take advantage of. Um, our Central Massachusetts Regional Public Health Alliance, of course, who have been connect connecting us, and they connected us to having some dedicated slots um, at the regional site at Worcester State University that's run jointly with St. Vincent's and Worcester State um, at the regional site there. So we do appreciate everyone's efforts to help uh, have our, our school staff uh, get access to the vaccine. Shifting gears now to uh, returning to full in-person school, it's great to put that check mark. Uh, this past Monday, all of our students in grades K to four whose parents wanted them to be in person returned uh, for their first week of uh, full in school uh, uh, altogether uh, educational programming. Um, then we're uh, on target to begin with grades five and six next week with a phase in starting Monday. Um, and then with the week after that is the school vacation week. After that, we'll be phasing in Oak Middle School, uh, grades seven and eight, uh, starting on Monday the 26th. Uh, and uh, then on Monday, May 3rd, the following week, we're targeting for the high school uh, grades nine to 12 to return. Um, this was a very successful uh, week. Uh, I, it was, you know, the, the product of a lot of hard work by a lot of people. Um, this is a first grade uh, class over at Floral Street School, and uh, it, it's a little bit different to see that number of students all together in the classroom, but it's a welcome sight. Um, looks a little bit different, too, because uh, those of people who have, are familiar with our elementary classrooms typically uh, not set up in the traditional desks and rows, usually more tables and groupings. Um, so uh, not the, the typical arrangement you would see in a Shrewsbury uh, elementary school, uh, but lots of smiles behind those masks and, and lots of thumbs up from students feeling very good about being back together uh, with their friends. Uh, several comments as I visited classrooms about being happy to be in person and not being on Zoom, mm -hmm. um, which is, has gotten old for everybody, including our youngest students. Um, this next photo is a photo of the gymnasium at Coolidge School. Um, this is lunchtime. Um, in all of our elementary schools, we have to utilize uh, the uh, gym as overflow space for lunch just because we still have six-foot distancing when kids don't have their masks on when they're eating. Um, and because at Patton School, uh, we only have the one space that doubles as both the cafeteria and a gymnasium, uh, we actually have a large tent uh, that Mr. Collins and his team procured and, and set up and worked with public buildings on that. Um, and they are utilizing that tent as additional cafeteria space. Uh, for al fresco dining uh, for our uh, patent students, uh, those fortunate enough to get out there in the tent. Um, so, uh, again, just another example of some of the logistics involved. And, uh, again, the kids were um, extremely uh, cooperative and flexible in the way that they're following all the different rules, uh, many of which are the same rules they've been following, just, just now with more students and, and uh, uh, making sure that we're keeping uh, uh, tabs on uh, making sure everyone's following the, the expectations when it comes to the mitigation strategies. Um, again, I want to thank our students and families uh, for all the flexibility they've shown as we've worked up to this point. Um, our educators and support staff, and that includes our, our tech folks, uh, certainly includes our nursing staff. Uh, our secretaries have been incredibly important for this. Um, certainly, uh, in, in addition to that, our custodians who work, of course, technically with the public buildings department, but uh, have been key along with all the other public building staff. Uh, our, our principals and our district administrators have been 
uh, doing all kinds of logistical planning, and they're a really, really strong team. And uh, uh, it was, uh, and then our partner with AA Transportation around busing, who had to make a lot of adjustments to scheduling and uh, new seating charts on the buses for kids, and a lot of kids who were starting to ride the bus for the first time. Uh, and, and things went, ran on time on Monday, and so far this week, uh, we, we've had logistics. I want to thank Shrewsbury Police Department, Officer Sean Vallier, who's our uh, school resource officer for the elementary grades, has worked with us on traffic control. Um, and thankfully, the traffic has not been quite as dramatic as we thought it might be, just with maybe more families choosing to drive their students instead of put them on the bus. Uh, but I, I really... We had a remarkably smooth reopening at the elementary level, uh, and that could not have happened if it hadn't been for the meticulous planning and the efforts that people put together. Um, in addition, our educators, of course, did a lot of planning over the last few weeks for how to make sure our students were kind of on the same, who had been a little bit on different schedules around some of their curriculum and things like that when they were operating as two cohorts, uh, you know, knitting that together and then making sure students felt welcome uh, and we're able to get down to business and, and visiting classrooms on the first day. And uh, I was able to get to all the schools except for Spring Street. I got to Spring Street yesterday. Um, it was, it, I mean, the, the instruction was business as usual. Kids were learning great stuff and uh, were enthusiastically participating. And um, other than the fact that they're in rows and they have masks on, you wouldn't know the difference. So a very, very successful week for our K-4 opening. Um, again, we're very excited about all the benefits that we get from students returning to that in-person instruction for five days a week all day. Um, we also, of course, respect the decision of the families who choose to keep their kids in the all-remote program. Um, and we're continuing to invest time and energy and focus on helping those students succeed with distance learning for the rest of the school year. Uh, I want to mention again that you know one of the potential challenges, hopefully if cases stay really low, uh, we'll be in pretty good shape. But if there are cases that come into classrooms, um, just by the nature of the three-foot distancing and the fact that the definition of a close contact remains based on six feet, um, it, it's, there will be more kids quarantined if there's a positive case than we had been experiencing pre previously. Uh, we have plans to work through those things and keep kids on track. Uh, but again, that is one potential issue with this return that we have to pay attention to. Uh, this uh, uh, graph here shows... Uh, the number of students in each grade uh, who are in-person versus who are all remote. Uh, obviously, a larger number of in-person students. Um, you see that that's uh, a little bit more uh, at the younger grades. And then as you get to the high school, more uh, opting for the in-person model. Um, in this next slide, you can see on a percentage basis, where about 30% of our students at the elementary level are still all remote. Um, about 27% at our middle schools and then 11% at the high school level, which is to be expected relative to uh, a little bit more of a maybe confidence in families and, and mm -hmm. having that and also just in terms of the experience as they're getting through their latter years um, of their K-12 to experience. Um, I just want to mention again that we did have some you know significant logistical challenges that we're overcoming um, and that, that three-foot distancing was part of it. Uh, Karen Isaacson, our Director of Extended Learning and who's overseeing the COVID assistance uh, did a lot of work along with our school-based uh, administrators and secretaries to uh, get, uh, you know, tape markings down for the desks. Mr. Collins worked carefully with uh, furniture vendors to make sure delivery and setup all went according to plan. Uh, again, we've purchased about 1,600 desks, about 300 tables, um, and uh, these are thankfully being able to be purchased using COVID grant funds. And you know, we're doing this phase in approach because we needed the time to be able to have our vendors work on that furniture piece, have the furniture shipped, um, and then to, to phase in some of these planning pieces. So it's been very complex, but so far it's gone very well, and we expect that will continue to be the case. So again, uh, things are getting better. Uh, we're returning to a more normal situation. The vaccine availability is definitely bringing more peace of mind to our staff. Um, we'll continue to follow the advice of experts as we look to uh, continue to phase in to return to full in-person learning as safely as possible, knowing that the risk, of course, is not zero, but we're balancing that risk with what the effects are of not being in person. And then uh, there's major benefits, uh, but also some additional risk with the quarantining that we'll see how that plays out in the coming weeks. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, or hear any comments that the committee has. Okay, thank you. Any questions, comments, Dale? So I have four questions. Uh -huh. One is remind me how the case ascertainment is for, for students both uh, who are in school as well as full remote. How do you find out 
if there's been a positive case, for example, on a remote student? Sure. So uh, we have access uh, to the MAVEN system. So any Shrewsbury case that tests as positive, um, it is in the age range. Uh, our, our nursing staff is able to check that against our enrollment. Um, so families typically would report it to us as well, but often we'll see it first in the MAVEN system. So that's a that's a pretty complete ascertainment, right? Really. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And with the pooled numbers, uh, when you say there are 9,000 tests or whatever, each pool is, is what, about seven individuals? How many are in are pooled together for a test? Sure. Uh, and just to be clear, those are the numbers of individuals who have tested, okay, uh, yeah. who are in That's the pools themselves. Yeah. And, then those, and then those pools are typically about, Patrick, I, I'm trying to remember, is about 16. Eight, 16? 16, okay. And then we're charged for each pool, and then we're only charged additional if there has to be what they call reflex testing, if, you know, the sure. pool turns out positive. Right. Um, and so far, you know, we've had a few, you know, number of weeks where we've had zero positives from any of the right. pools. And then I think the most we've had in any one week is just two. Um, so, uh, you know, it really has been kind of interspersed across those different That's weeks. Terrific. The uh, other thought that comes to mind is we are able to return to full in-person right now with the three-foot distancing, but also the fact that... Uh, 20 or 30 percent of the students in a grade are remaining full remote. Uh, has there been any thought to what might happen in September if we're still dealing with a three-foot uh, standard, but everybody is supposed to be coming back? Sure. Um, yes, we're thinking about that, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know we're we're trying to get our other grades back first now. But uh, you know, in, in some cases. Um, you know, we still have spaces at the elementary level that we're not using for in-person because we don't need to because the number of kids who are out and there are actually teachers teaching the remote classes, the kids who are at home, but they're teaching them from a classroom in the school. Um, so there certainly are some classroom spaces that aren't being utilized right now that next fall, um, and, you know, the Commissioner of Education has indicated that the expectation would be that by next fall, assuming things continue to go uh, as expected with the pandemic winding down, uh, that families would not be offered under the emergency rules the opportunity or the choice to, to be uh, educated remotely by the school district um, unless they had um, a demonstrated health issue that prevented a student from being here. Um, so we, we don't expect that the uh, so-called cohort D option uh, would be available next fall. So bringing those students back in is something we'll have to work through. Um, in terms of the spacing at the uh, middle in the high school and they'll be a bit more challenging frankly uh, but uh, that's something that we'll have to uh, you know continue to work on figuring out and uh, the fact that there are a number of students who are out definitely takes some of the pressure off in some cases uh, elementary I think is a little more manageable middle and high school remains to be seen lunch of course is a challenge um, the hope would be that even the three foot piece you know is, is no longer maybe maybe people are still wearing masks but uh, obviously, it's hard to predict exactly what might be in place next fall, uh, depending on access to vaccine and uh, for younger students and where where the pandemic is as far as case counts. Mm -hmm. But that's definitely something that we're thinking about and uh, we need to be planning for. Yeah. And last uh, question, and that is, it's been a year of putting out fires, mm -hmm. and um, it's such a unique experience. Is, is Has there been any thought to gathering uh, photographs and other materials to make a history of this year? Well, I, I think that that's uh, an excellent suggestion. I think there's a lot of photographic evidence that our uh, principals and other folks in, in the buildings are, are taking. And I think the idea of creating some sort of repository, um, I, I, we just finished uh, sending off uh, a week or so ago uh, the annual report for the town's annual report. And you know, a lot of what I wrote at the front part was trying to help people who might be reading this years down the line kind of understand what happened last March and how we worked through mm -hmm. the rest of the calendar year uh, 2020 and I'm sure we'll be writing about that again when we have the 2021 town report uh, but I do think it's important and you know archiving even even the uh, various presentations we've done over the course of the year which are always archived on our website but finding a way to make sure that you know for the Shrewsbury Historical Society I think it'd make a lot of sense to reach out and that's the kind of thing potentially our high school students and uh, the social sciences department there may be some interest in working with them to try to document some of these pieces because it certainly is a uh, historical time uh, for sure so excellent suggestion thank you jason just a comment i want to extend my compliments and thanks to everyone who was involved with the reopening uh, of our elementary schools at every level from the staff 
some of whom overcame uh, significant personal fears to, to go back in and, and to do that very important work, to the administrative team who did all of the planning necessary, to the support staff, to everybody who helped make all of the logistics a reality, to the families uh, who, who, who coped well with quick change, and, and to the students who brought their unique brand of enthusiasm, which I know is very helpful to a lot of our staff as well. I just want to extend my thanks and compliments to everyone who made this very significant logistical feat a big success. Thank you. John? Yeah, I just want to thank Dr. Sir for the presentation. Mm -hmm. Very encouraging uh, data shared around pool testing, closing in on 10,000 um, tests and 99.9% uh, .9 negative, uh, in addition to the numbers you shared about staff vaccinations. I think both of these uh, offer peace of mind to both families and, uh, and educators. I think this is a really good news story. Uh, and uh, similar to Mr. Pallage, I'd like to thank everybody involved with this, this uh, K through four reopening. I received many unsolicited comments and compliments about how smooth things were uh, from Patton and from uh, Floral in particular. Uh, so I know this is a huge effort. I uh, just wanna commend everybody uh, involved on the logistical planning that went into this and just overall, just the smooth transition. So thank you so much. And, and last night, uh, Mr. Wenske and myself had the opportunity to meet with the spring PTO and Mr. Maybe, principal, just happened to comment about how it had been just such a wonderful experience to have everybody back in the building, teachers and students, and parents were commenting how they were so happy to have children back, you know, out of the house, but also back in person learning. And I know um, I'm an individual who has um, permanently working at home. And I am so happy to get out of the house and come to these meetings. And my family is very happy to have me come to these <laughs> meetings. So, I mean, it's that type of interaction that you need. You need that in-person type of um, learning experience for students. So, and I just, again, thank central office staff and all of the administrators who have worked so hard to get this up and running in a very short amount of time. It was a huge logistical challenge. And with all the other work that you're doing behind the scenes, this, this is just one piece of what you're doing. So thank you very much. But I do have a question and it's for you, Barb, and I think your microphone is off. So maybe Jason can just turn his microphone toward you. Um, I, just, I just had a question around um, staff and vaccinations because I know sometimes there are side effects for some individuals. How are we doing with any absenteeism and finding subs? Has it been an issue for us or are we doing okay? No, we, we're doing okay. There have been some staff who have had significant side effects. There have been others who have been able to come in no problem the next day. Um, I don't have hard numbers for you, but we haven't had um, widespread problems with subs any worse than we've had all year long. So okay. in other words, we didn't take a difficult situation and then compound it. Um, we have been able to um, cover pretty well. I Good. particularly follow the elementary um, on a daily basis and, and it seems to be going smoothly. I believe there was only one day in you know the recent couple of weeks mm -hmm. where we had a, a real shortage okay good that, that was pretty good I'd say three three or four weeks and we've moved through a lot of staff already having vaccinations and so we're yeah, kind of moving I, out of I'm that really hopefully. glad that um, Noel Freeman has collected that information because that's incredibly encouraging mm -hmm. um, that so many staff are taking it seriously and taking their place in line. And we have 48% of those who responded to the survey already, you know, With two, done and just, just right. you know, half of those are waiting out their 14 days. That's fantastic. Excellent, good, yeah. thank you. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Okay, anything further, Dr. Sawyer? No, I, I would just say that, again, I think that, you know, we, we, this is a long time coming, uh, and the planning that has been done going back to the winter and the fall before that. Mm -hmm. Uh, looking towards the targeting about this time of year where we felt it would be reasonable as the numbers started to moderate. Um, I think that the uh, it, it shouldn't be lost uh, that the quality of what our teachers provided under the hybrid model um, and, and are continuing to provide in the all remote mm -hmm. model, I think was exceptionally high. Um, I continue to get anecdotal uh, information from families talking about uh, folks from other communities uh, who are asking our parents to send along the plans that our teachers have created for hybrid, you know, the, the uh, asynchronous part of the learning that students were doing. 
just because the quality was so high, the, the quality of the video uh, lessons that teachers were creating, um, and really in a way that is, has been extremely uh, collaborative. And I think that those are some of the silver linings that will come from this. I think the level of collaboration across the district, mm -hmm. especially at the elementary level, where obviously it's more of a siloed situation under normal times, uh, given that there are five different buildings, um, really has been uh, outstanding. And I think that, you know, all along, uh, as much as we certainly prefer kids to be in person and families are willing to send them, um, and there are lots of benefits to that, uh, I, I think the fact that we did a lot of work to focus on the quality of what students were experiencing, um, and not that it's a substitute for in-person learning, but I do believe that what was being provided was, was of... Uh, uh, was really excellent um, and I think that will pay off obviously in terms of where students are we're going to be paying close attention to where students are um, in terms of their progress um, and uh, it is not without uh, you know we, we know there's going to be some kids behind where they should be uh, at the same time a lot of kids have done very well and and I think that that's a real tribute to the quality of the of the planning and the uh, execution that our educators brought to this uh, all along this year um, and so, you know, as we move forward into this last phase of the school year, um, there's still a lot of time left, and it's an important time. And uh, I'm really confident that we're going to have a very strong ending uh, to what has been an incredibly challenging situation. Thank you. And I think it's also a testament to the culture of this district for many years that we had a foundation to, to fall back on when this whole pandemic started, which was something we had never experienced. And I think because of everything you've done, and, and all the other individuals that have been involved um, had that foundation to move on. So thank you again for everything that you've all done. Okay, now we're going to move on to something very exciting, which is um, the new bail project. We have with us tonight Sean Brennan. He is the project architect from LPA, and Walter Hartley is here from PMA. And we are going to have a presentation which will show uh, what it looks like at this point in the project. One brief introductory uh, comment, and that is that uh, this project really has been uh, nothing but a good news story from uh, the start uh, to the present uh, time. And that uh, much of that success is attributed to these two gentlemen uh, who are going to sit here in, in a second and give you a, an update. Um, you know, we're looking at substantial completion of this project, which is a real milestone towards the latter part of May, and of course, uh, occupancy for uh, our school children uh, this coming fall. And uh, so this is really exciting to be able to have them present to you some uh, updated information, but also we're really looking forward to, hopefully very soon, uh, inviting the school committee on site uh, to do uh, a walkthrough and kind of see it firsthand as well. Well, we snuck um, in already, Pat. Okay. We did. So with that, I'll turn it over to Walter and Sean. How many slides Ah, awesome. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, saw all you just yeah. a little while ago, but I'll get into that in a little bit. Walt, Walter's going to give us an update on uh, where we're at schedule-wise and contract-wise and everything else. Absolutely. Uh, so thanks for having us. Um, so kind of jumping back in time a little bit. Um, in the middle of 2019, uh, we started construction with the 60% uh, documents. We started with demo and abatement of the existing structures that were there, the old uh, Glavin Center. Um, and we also started with site work. Um, so we had been working through that. That completed uh, in September of 19. Uh, the Lake Street realignment was completed at, uh, in late November of 2019. Uh, one caveat to that is that the final paving hasn't occurred yet, but I think a lot of you have driven down that road. It is much safer now, and um, you can see the vehicles coming from quite a distance away. Um, we have uh, incorporated into the project a little bit more paving, um, which is probably a really good decision by the town. Um, it's going to have less seams. Uh, we're actually going down towards uh, the Buffalo Wild Wings towards Route 9 and then all the way to High Lear Ave um, with the new paving. Um, so that's going to coincide with the uh, finish of the project uh, in the next few months. Um, after those two tasks were completed, we uh, LPA completed the 90% documents, and that's when we purchased the concrete and structural steel. Uh, those went to the SBC on 9, 10, 19, and that, uh, at those activities started quickly on the heels of that with 100%. We bid out the project to the remaining filed subs, the trade contractors, um, and those have been in swing since. 
Um, you'll see on there, a lot of the tasks have been completed. The retaining walls were completed in mid-December of 2019. The foundations were completed er, uh, late January. Structural steel uh, was completed on March 9th, 2020. Uh, you'll notice that that's a little bit later than the topping off. That's because there's uh, detailing that goes on. So I believe the to topping off ceremony was uh, mid-February of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, building with, was weather tight in September of 2020. Permanent power was turned on in mid-November last year. Uh, kind of the last two big items for uh, um, targeting to get done are the elevator inspections uh, in the beginning of May and then building commissioning, which is ongoing at this point in time, but it's really making sure all the systems work, all the RTUs are on, um, and that's going to be an ongoing activity um, probably through May and, and into June. Um, no issue for substantial completion on that, but as a... Uh, Patrick had mentioned we are targeting substantial completion with a certificate of occupancy on May 28th, 2021, so about two months away. Um, punch list is going to begin in early May and, and run through the summer. Um, for, I believe Fontaine has a, an extended date there through the 820, but they're, they're going to aim to finish that a lot earlier. Uh, final cleaning in early August and then final completion 11-121. If you want to jump to the next slide. So this is a, a quick snapshot of uh, schedule from Primavera, um, and it's showing the critical path and the activities that are left uh, on the construction side. Um, mechanical drops for those equipments, so just putting in the registers and the grills and the covers. Uh, lighting, uh, ceiling tiles, so flooding the ceilings. Uh, final paint touch-ups. Signage for the building, specifically emergency exit signage and, and door room signage. Uh, flooring is wrapping up, and then that takes us right into punch list and final cleaning. Um, and this is what Fontaine uses to get the job done. They know where they need to be. They know the dates they need to hit, um, and it's built right upon that. Jump to the last one. I apologize. This is a little bit smaller on the screen. Um, but uh, the total project budget was about $92 million as as the voters approved uh, and through the PFA bid amendment. Uh, we have invoiced 60 million through February. That's not to say we have 32 million left. We are <laughs> trending under budget at this point in time. Um, we have about $185,000 in change orders, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, that's a testament to LPA's design and, and their high quality drawings. Um, and also Fontaine really being able to buy everything out um, and incorporate any type of issues we foresaw as we were purchasing that GMP with them. Uh, included in the GMP to make sure we have the money to get the job done. Um, contracts to date are about $84 million, so it, it is significantly lower than the 92. Um, and reimbursement to date is about $21,150,000, uh, right, right around that number, uh, from the MSBA. Uh, the max grant, I believe, is about $27 million. Um, <coughs> We will not get to that number because we are not going to spend the full project budget, uh, which is a good thing. Um, but it does reduce the grant as you come down. So those are my three slides, and Sean has a lot more interesting stuff to show you and talk about. So I'll turn it over to him. Awesome. Um, so what you're about to see here is another virtual walkthrough, uh, fly around the building. I'm just going to kind of narrate over it. So. Uh, existing glabbing site, no longer there. Uh, anyone who's been up there, it, it's quite dramatic change. Uh, to kind of bring everyone's memory back, the building, two-story building, you enter kind of on a one-story side, and then it drapes over the hillside to two-story academic wings. And the lower right is going to be where all the student community garden, raised garden beds are going to be. In the middle is going to be some more raised garden beds. We call that the butterfly grove because there's going to be a lot of pollinators in there. And then coming around this side here is the kindergarten wing that has its own dedicated playground off of it. And then the larger green space that's coming up into the foreground is actually going to be a full-size youth soccer field for uh, gym classes to use during the day. Uh, coming in on access to the main entrance, the parking lot is terraced. Uh, there is going to be a clearly designated pedestrian path into the building. We have canopies at the bus loop drop-off, which is here, and also canopies at the lower drop-off, where parents will drop off their students daily. 
as you enter into the building, security is very similar to Sherwood. You get buzzed into the vestibule, then you get buzzed into a second door into the admin, which is on the right. As you look to the left here, you're starting to see a, a mural, uh, which I'll get into a little bit further on. But here is the cafeteria. This view out the cafeteria windows is south over the Shrewsbury youth soccer fields. Uh, this is the stage. Uh, much Sherwood has the uh, gymatorium. We have the cafetorium here. Heading back into the lobby, kind of the unifying feature, you see a history wall there, which I'll get into a little more detail later on. Uh, you proceed across the hallway into the gymnasium. Uh, gymnasium was sized so that you could have a school-wide assembly. So the, the occupancy is posted for 900. Uh, that would include students and staffs, and if you have any extra speakers. Coming back into the lobby, as you can see, that unifying feature wall carries through the entire building. Uh, this is the main processional stair down to the lower level. Uh, this is where the mural really opens up to be a two-story feature wall. Um, this is something we're, we're, we're extremely excited, and I don't want to get too much into the details. I want you to be able to just take in the video as we speak. We're backing into the media center here. As you can see, that, that L kind of wood up and over feature carries right through the building. It's a strong unifying element uh, that all the major core spaces are off of. A nice open steer to connect it all, that main courtyard. And as we turn back, you'll see similar kind of aesthetic that you saw in the front of the building as you entered through the main entrance reflects back um, in the main courtyard there. So what we have here, uh, I'm going to go through some renderings, and then I also have some construction photo updates to kind of give you kind of the juxtaposition of where we were during design and what you got to see before and, and what it looks like today. Uh, so these are uh, the common rooms. This is the kindergarten common room. Uh, so just like Sherwood, we have used colors to reinforce wayfinding. So for those of you that may or not be familiar with Sherwood, there are L-shaped academic wings, and there's a designated color for each singular wing. Uh, we find at this age group, it really helps reinforce wayfinding for those students, um, and it's a great thing. Uh, as you can see here, this is that mural that's at the existing Beale. Uh, we also found a way to incorporate that into the lower lobby. Um, and if you could advance to the next slide, because this is, I think, just going to loop through and play again. I won't, I won't make you guys go through all that. So this bringing you back to the video, this is just after we stepped into the vestibule. Uh, this is the main lobby. The main lobby, uh, we have a longer walk-off mat um, into the school, part of a lead cr credit, but it's also a great thing as far as long-term maintenance to really uh, make sure those, everybody can knock out their shoes on their way in. But then we transition to a terrazzo tile floor. We have a brick masonry finish on the set. And then this ceiling plane, just like the uh, accent wall, continues through the whole building. So on the left side, you'll see a little bit of the mural. But on the right side, what we really want you to see here is the existing bar relief that is in the vestibule at the existing Beale School. Some of you may or may not know, this was actually purchased by the class, I think, of 1926. I, I apologize to the class of 1926 if I'm off by a few <laughs> years. Uh, it was purchased for $50. They paid the extra, I think, $25 for the frame, uh, the, the little mantle lintel to go with it. Uh, but it, it's a fantastic piece. I, I mean, it's, it's such a treasure. Uh, and... Um, we are sending this out. It is going to be taken down. It is going to be refurbished. Um, there are a few chip missing pieces. They're going to touch up the paint, and it's going to be reinstalled here. Just to the right of that is going to be the existing dedication plaque for the Beale High, uh, which was the Beale High School, junior, senior high, as you know. And then just uh, right above that or below it, depending on how we start to do it, will be the new dedication plaque for this school. Um, and just to the left of that, where you see the gentleman in the white shirt and the dark trousers, you see a television screen and what is kind of a wood veneered wall. That is a history wall. Uh, and if you could advance to the next slide. Uh, as you can see here, as you approach the wall, um, before I get too far into this, I do want to thank everybody who has been a part of this. So you may or may not know, this has kind of been a community-led effort. Um, through the efforts of, I'm definitely going to miss some people here, but Amy Clowder definitely helps rearhead it. Uh, Jennifer DeFrancesca has been the uh, staff with the student liaison, all the students she's been integrating with. Uh, Chris Gustafson at the Shrewsbury Historical Society. 
-hmm. Mr. Deal McGee, thank you very much <laughs> also for your efforts with this. And then Mike Perna has also been helping uh, w with this effort. So as you can see, the, the concept here is uh, this idea of growing from the past. And we used uh, kind of a nonlinear concept. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll get a little better scent. Uh, if you keep going, yeah. You get a little bit of sen better sense of it. It's the idea that um, we have these tree rings in the sense that there is a linear nature from left to right, and, and there'll be century marks. But it's the idea that there will be these plexiglass plaques that are kind of arranged on those rings. And the idea is that we will not fill necessarily all these plaques, nor do we have to mount all these plaques on this wall. But the idea is that uh, I, I think two of the gentlemen in the audience are realizing they're on the TV interview. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> it, uh, so the the great part about this is it it is not a, a snapshot in time. It can, it can continue to be added it can continue to change. As we know, you know, this idea of growing from our past, there might be something that we find out that it was put on here that was culturally insensitive, mm -hmm. and they want to change 100 years from now, and they have the opportunity mm -hmm. to do it. That's what's exciting about the way we've set this up, is it's really something that the students continue to engage in, that are currently engaged in, um, and, and through everyone's efforts, I think it's really going to be great. Uh, just to the left of this, there's a larger display case that even if there was ever something, you know, along the lines of a theme to what what do we want to add, you know, over the next 10 years, you could have kind of a d design competition with the students and it could be up in that display case and, the, and they get a sense of what they want to do. The television screen that's coupled with this is is a way to to roll in, you know, other other historical elements, footage to engage students, to prompt them to ask questions about certain things. So it's another educational feature that much like any of your digital signage you have in schools, the staff and, and uh, administration are up to use any way they want to, to really kind of engage people with this uh, particular element in the school. If you go to the next slide. Uh, this is just some of the examples. So that's uh, a picture of schoolhouse number seven with everyone out front. We got some really fantastic photos thus far. Uh, we, we've got like two boxes from the historical society. We're digging up the room. I also want to mention Natalie Gab Gabrielle from my office who's spearheading this effort uh, in her conjunction with that. And if you can keep going, we'll get a close up. So the idea is that this is, uh, if you can imagine sandwich panels, a plexiglass with, with nice clean looking uh, stub mm -hmm. mounts it is really how it's going to be attached to that uh, feature wall. Uh, and you advance from there. Here's another one. I don't know if anyone rec anyone recognize where this is. Cafeteria in Beale. Yeah, Beale oh, Cafeteria. Geez. Which is yeah, yeah. It's a trip, huh? So it's it's fantastic that you guys have have this. I mean, you were just talking about the okay. legacy of having photos from this year. Uh, and God, 1920s. You guys even had them from then. So this is this is fantastic. Next slide. Uh, so to give you an update where we are now. Um, this is the main entrance. Uh, we're under the canopy. You can see that large element that goes up and over. They're currently working on the concrete sidewalks and unit pavers that are go going to go out front, masonry pavers. Next slide. Uh, this is that large feature wall that it, we're looking through the cafeteria, is it through the glass below. Next slide. Uh, that wall, as you advance further down, that's the stair we walked down in the video, as you may recall earlier, and that's where the mural opens up to be a two-story mural. Next slide. Looking back towards the main entrance, you, you see that the glass I was just talking about to the cafeteria, that's the vestibule lower, and then there's a clear story windows above. Next slide. Uh, into the cafeteria. So we saw, we had a quick glimpse of that. It's gonna have a, you know, you saw some very colorful tables. There's gonna be some colorful flooring. The surround will be covered in a similar wood finish. And we have some really fun, playful lighting in here also. Uh, occupancy in here is 525, so you guys will be able to put on some good productions. Music rooms back up to the rear of this, much like Sherwood is. There's a handicap access both within and from the rear to the stage. So it's, it's really very inclusive. Uh, I will note and add again, the entire site is handicap express, accessible. We don't have a single grade, even road grade, that's above 5%. So anyone who has any, any limitations will have full access to school, which is fantastic. It's very difficult to do these days, and, and it, this site really allowed us to achieve it. Next slide. Uh, you may recognize, it's a little difficult. <laughs> There's a couple of them are in disguise here, but. Uh, 
Uh, it did have the school committee out. We met on a, a Monday morning. Uh, and if you're wondering what they're looking at, the next slide gives you a sense. So this is that view westerly out over the main courtyard to the Worcester Hills. Uh, you really don't quite get the full view out, but you know there is going to be some the planting and landscaping plan in the raised garden bed program is going to be incredible. It is, it, the, I, I, I just if you can't tell, I'm excited, guys. It, it's like it's really, really exciting. So, uh, next slide. Uh, this is getting down into the media center. You really got to start to get a sense of scale. What's going on there? So this portion of the media center. Um, so the media center has a maker space off to the left. It has a larger kind of seating area here, stacks in the middle, and then there's kind of two breakout spaces that have interactive whiteboards uh, and or projection, and this is one of them. But this also can double as the larger meeting space for staff, afternoon meetings, um, so it can hold the entire staff during those times, which is also great. Next slide. Uh, that wall to the right that you see that has the joint compound on it is where one of the projection screens will go, but the but this volume that you see that's engaging with this side of the media center is the art rooms. So the art rooms have a direct connection to the media center, which kind of reinforce um, because there is the scheduling for this school worked out to be a 1.5 on the art rooms. So you kind of have some swing periods that you can use that middle art room class for, uh, and just goes to show how close that connection is and how much uh, benefit you guys will get out of that. Next slide. This is the courtyard uh, that I was talking about, the main courtyard, the Butterfly Grove. Those are the raised planter beds not yet assembled in the foreground. Next slide. And here's one of the common rooms that you saw a rendering of earlier. So similar to Sherwood, uh, getting a little into the details here, but uh, egress is built into this uh, floor pattern in the sense that two of the stripes need to remain open at any time to maintain life safety for these students. It's a concept that Sherwood's been doing since 2011 when that school opened so not unfamiliar um, to, to staff or, or st students in the district in that sense even though we're gonna have much younger students here obviously uh, but we have a sink as you can see uh, there in the back left and next slide here's a corridor leading out of that common room so as you can see this is the blue wing the deeper blue wing that's the color that really reinforces this wing next slide uh, this is the walkway leading to where the student drop-off and pick-up is. You can kind of see the canopy that's there. So the idea is very similar to how a lot of your elementary schools work. We're utilizing, utilizing the paved play area as a pick-up and drop-off area. So it's one way in, one way out. Um, as far as site circulation goes on this site, bus circulation and parent circulation are completely separated. It's fantastic. Completely separated all the way out to the road. There's no point where they mix. They come in two separate curb cuts off of Lake Street. Uh, really allows that. And as you may or not recall, we had uh, really big concerns about backing up towards Route 9 uh, during drop-off or pickup. We actually have enough room for queuing of 120 cars on site, and that's before they're picking up. If all of a sudden they realize 120 is not enough and you want to start letting people out one of the other side doors, we could probably fit, you know, 200 plus cars on site. So you even have that flexibility of reworking where you're actually having parents pick up and drop off if you realize it's going to be a, he a heavy kind of flow day that year for parents um, you have that built-in capacity next slide uh, we have a fantastic outdoor classroom space so that is a copper beech tree uh, it's got that kind of elephant toe looking root system on the bottom if you're not familiar with the tree I wish there was a person in this. This thing is massive. It is, it, but it is fantastic. And and we have, as I mentioned, fully accessible site. So we have a pathway up on the sidewalk and a in a uh, sloped walkway, no handrails, that leads you all the way up to the spot, where parents, uh, I mean, staff can bring the students up for an outdoor learning session. Next slide. And that's um. So I apologize. I actually thought I had. I think they played through on me a little quick. So. On the mural, if you want to go back, Brian, if you don't mind, I, I, I didn't realize those were fully animated. I might go to one with the mural kind of show. Go, go down one from there. So this mural on the left, so um, I had mentioned those that you, the, on the second floor of Beale Elementary School, the existing Beale Elementary School, there was a mural done in 2005 by award-winning artists, not necessarily at that time, but now since then, Peter Reynolds. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Peter Reynolds, we approached him after we were looking to retouch that 
try to get him to touch up his signature and everything else, and we're really grasping at what this mural could be about. And he's, he was interested. And uh, as you know, uh, through the generous donations of Chief Joseph, Robert Jacanian, we were able to commission um, Peter Reynolds to do a full mural. Uh, to give you a sense of this, this mural at its tallest portion is about 21 feet tall. It is 135 feet long. Uh, and, it, and he filled every inch of it. Um, and not only did he fill every inch of it, he filled every inch of it with every possible hope, dream, creative, insightful, invoking thing you could think of between people, between words, between colors. And if you have heard him speak about this, he is just really interested in enticing even the most stubborn amongst us to be creative, just to kind of be yourself, whatever it is, right, wrong, or indifferent, but just kind of being yourself. And, and that's his hope for this mural. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, it is in process. Uh, we have had some feedback amongst the community on what we'd like to see involved in that. We've had feedback from the staff uh, and administration, and we've now incorporated all those um, comments into that. And uh, we're excited for, for it to finally be put in place. And I will stop now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm excited. I, I want to give you guys as much as I can. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, and I know we had a very exciting walk through ourselves. Yeah, John. No, I uh, thank you both for the presentation mm -hmm. and the meticulous attention to detail in this project. Mm -hmm. Sean, I love, I love your passion for this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just, it shows just in how you're giving that tour as that, uh, you know, video was playing and uh, just, you know, can just tell you from you know, what we saw when we were on site. I mean, I think the, the location coupled with the thoughtful design I think just makes for a very unique school in this town like unlike anything we've seen and we've had a lot of really good school building projects but this is just outstanding I mean there are views for days in this building every corner of the building you see just a different view of the town that you haven't seen before so and I love the thought behind the history wall and preserving mm -hmm. Beale's history I also had to laugh too as you were giving us the tour of the nurse's office my mom spent 20 years of her life in the closet in the old one there as the school nurse. And when you told us that there are two exam rooms in the Beale School Nurse's Office, just it, it was, I went back and, and called my mom. I'm like, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> so uh, it was just a great tour, and I appreciate uh, all, the, all the work that, uh, that you've done on this. Thank you. Thank you. And I know it was so exciting to walk through, and we had a – meeting, a Bill Billing Committee meeting, and Sean said, hey, if anybody wants a tour, <laughs> I immediately said, you know, we want one right away. And Dr. Sawyer was unable to go with us that day, and as soon as we got back, I sent up my, like, you need to have a tour and see, you know, the, the status, because he had said he had not been over there yet. And I think, you know, like, we kind of had this, like, dream team between the two of you with Fontaine Brothers, the site. I, I was blown away by just how, first of all, how big it is. How much work has gone on since I think we went in in May as the building committee and it was open, you know, a year ago, May, and it, it was open and there's so much work has gone on already. Um, Dale, uh, this whole history project and the incorporation of that I think is really amazing and to look 100 years ago and now look at what we have in the technology. Um, I just think it's an amazing building and then um, Peter Reynolds piece and the building committee actually he came and spoke I mean he's kind of a big deal in children's literature and he spoke to us about his vision and what that meant and what the whole piece really means which spoke more you know when we first looked at it I really wasn't sure what it all meant and to have him really explain it to us was and take the time to meet with us I think was really impressive uh, this is just an unbelievably impressive building. Um, and again, the views. Yeah. And it's a great Amazing. spot to, to watch fireworks. We yes. all know that right now. So this is going to be a really, really good, <laughs> a good gem for this uh, community going forward. Jason. 
Uh, just, uh, I want to thank uh, everybody who's worked on this. This is an astounding space, and this is uh, more than just a building. This is something that's going to improve the educational experience in Shrewsbury. It emphasizes to me, and first of all, I think it's worth noting how under budget this project is Absolutely. so far. This is a beautiful building, and certainly you walk around and you think expensive, but this is so far costing us substantially less uh, than the voters authorized at the ballot box in 2018. Uh, and, and it makes it very clear to me how important it is for all of us as community members to make sure we're putting the right educational programming in this building. I do also want to thank in particular Mrs. Fritz for rec uh, representing all of us on the building committee. Oh, thank you. I know that that is substantial additional work on top of uh, all of the work that we heave on to you as our chairperson. <laughs> uh, so we appreciate you uh, continuing in that role for probably three years now. I don't even know. Thank you. It's <laughs> really, like it's, <laughs> I've, I've actually learned, it's, I've learned a lot. It's something, you know, I knew nothing about. So it's, you know, working with these gentlemen and everybody on that team, it's just really, really interesting work to, to be involved in. So thank you. Anything else? Dr. Sawyer. Uh, I, I certainly want to thank uh, everyone involved, uh, certainly the Sean and Walter and their respective teams at LPA and PMA. Uh, and they've been a dynamic team mm -hmm. uh, for the town based on the project at Sherwood, the, pro the library project, mm -hmm. and now this. Um, you know, projects that are going to serve our community well for decades and decades to come because of their quality and the really smart, responsive design. Uh, and, uh, Fontaine Brothers, the first time they've done a school project for our community. Uh, they also constructed the library and the fire station before that, and, and I think that it's a uh, testament, you know, the, the issue that we are certainly trending you know on time and under budget is, is all three of those organizations are really excellent partners for the town um, in terms of the uh, what this will be for students I, I think it will be uh, just a, an unbelievable space uh, for learning uh, for staff to work in uh, we, are, we are very very fortunate that our community has been so supportive over the past uh, you know, two decades 25 years really going on now uh, when you go back to sort of the, the beginning of um, sort of a renaissance, so to speak, in, in school construction, mm -hmm. with the Floral Street School opening in 1997, uh, which pe when people ask how old that building is, they're, they're shocked mm -hmm. that it's 20, almost a 25-year-old build, year old building now. Um, in terms of the, uh, the quality of Shrewsbury High School, of, of the, the, the renovation of Oak, uh, Sherwood Middle School, um, and now this uh, project, uh, you know, it were really... Uh, I think it, it does a lot. Uh, it, you know, I think I think how how communities uh, the decisions communities make about the schools they construct says a lot about the values of that community. And I think the, these these buildings and this new building uh, speak loud and clear that Shrewsbury is a community that values education um, and values its youngest citizens. Um, and it will be it will be a great resource for lots of the community citizens mm -hmm. for sure. So. Very much looking forward to uh, a time when we'll be able to open it to the public for a tour, uh, when, when we're up and online sometime next year. Obviously, we'll have to figure that out with the pandemic, and hopefully we're back to a place where we can we can do that in a reasonable time. Uh, I'm sure the dedication will be. I know Mr. Reynolds, the ar ar artist, uh, is hoping to be able to come to the dedication and speak with the, the students, and, and uh, there's a lot of things that have come together uh, to really make this work. Um, I, I think it's, it, it bears uh, thanking uh, Mr. Uh, Jim Kane, who, who uh, did a lot of work, not only as the chair of the building committee up until recently, uh, but uh, was, was really instrumental in making sure we were able to procure uh, this particular site uh, for the building. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, with, with some of the uh, work that happened and connecting with, with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, because that's a site, you know, oftentimes we know what happens in communities that a, a site might open up because something uh, is on the way out and communities don't act, and then it becomes something they would prefer not to have there. Uh, but, I, you know, for the Glavin Center, which served uh, the, you know, its population so well for so many decades, but then when it became defunct, uh, for now this to be turned into um, a site where Shrewsbury Youth Soccer has a permanent home, farmland, uh, and as well as a wonderful site for an elementary school. Um, there, there's a lot here for our town to be very proud of. So, again, I want to thank Walter and Sean for presenting this evening. And... Uh, I know we'll talk about this in a moment. Now, now the responsibility for the town is to get this school open Absolutely. and kids into it uh, next fall. Um, so, uh, again, thank you for everything. We're, we're very, very excited about this, uh, this project. And thank you very much for coming out and showing this. And we're going to have feedback, I'm sure, as it gets right to the end and have another presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.
Okay, next on the agenda, we are going to talk about a resolution in favor of the operational override question, which is going to be on the ballot on May 4th. On Friday, March 26th, the Board of Selectmen did vote to place the override question on the ballot. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sawyer and Mr. Collins. Um, thank you. Uh, so there is a draft resolution in your packet. Uh, this slide deck will uh, present some of that same information and also try to orient those who are watching. Uh, this is actually the first uh, meeting we, the school committee has had since the Board of Selectmen did vote uh, to put this resolution on the ballot. And so on this slide, you can see uh, the actual text of the question. Uh, and I would suggest that this is one of the most important questions uh, that's being asked of the community um, in any of its recent history, and maybe for many years. Um, and the question is whether uh, the, the community will uh, be allowed uh, to assess, or the town will be allowed to assess an additional $9.5 million in real estate taxes and personal property taxes for the purpose of funding both municipal and school operating expenses uh, beginning this next fiscal year on July 1st. Uh, a yes vote um, really will be a significant benefit to our town. Uh, the additional revenue that's generated from municipal departments and school department operating expenses uh, will be substantial and much needed. Um, and I think it, it really is important to emphasize that this will bring financial stability uh, for our town government. Um, and I know that uh, Mr. Mizakar, uh, the town manager, has been going over a lot of the details of this approach with the Board of Selectmen and with the Finance Committee and the joint meetings that you've had. Uh, but essentially this is uh, raising enough uh, uh, of uh, a ceiling, uh, or, the, or the floor, I guess, of taxes, um, so that uh, not only can the immediate needs of the town be met, uh, but that a substantial portion can be put into a stabilization account uh, that can then be drawn on uh, down the line. Uh, that financial stability then, you know, is, is based on this whole idea of fiscal responsibility and transparency. Uh, the agreement that has been... Uh, uh, voted unanimously by the school committee and the board of selectmen uh, in, in you know, conjunction with one another um, to exercise fiscal discipline, which has always been a hallmark of Shrewsbury, um, and, to, and to therefore be able to, based on this plan and with this uh, uh, approach of a stabilization fund, uh, to commit to the community that, you know, barring some unforeseen circumstance, uh, that there would be no additional Proposition 2.5 override questions for the next four years. Um, and I think that gives a, a level of certainty um, uh, to the, the voting populace. Um, and as a result of this approach, it gives certainty to Mr. Mizakar and the department heads from the municipal side and certainly to us on, on the school department side um, that there is going to be a certain amount of funding available because we have become increasingly reliant on local funding. Um, the state really leveled out the amount of funding our community was receiving. Uh, especially for education based on you know, the, the wealth, uh, uh, the relative wealth of the community. Um, and so it's critical um, that we take personal responsibility as a community for providing the resources we need to provide the services that our community expects. A yes vote on question one uh, will provide sufficient resources for our schools. Uh, it will maintain our current staffing and programming. Um, it will add the staff necessary to properly open uh, the new Beale School, and you just got a great glimpse of what that's going to look like when we get students and, and staff into that building um, and out of the very old uh, current Beale, and also draw students away from the other schools to relieve the overcrowding we have at the other elementary schools. It also provides sufficient resources to provide tuition-free full-day kindergarten, which we know the vast, vast majority, 95% or so, of districts already provide to their students. Um, it's, it's time is, is well past overdue that Shrewsbury provide that opportunity uh, for our own uh, children in, in, as far as kindergarten access. Um, it also will allow us to incrementally restore positions and programming that's been supports that have been cut in previous years. Um, we had you know, a difficult year this year where we cut about 30 positions, uh, about $1.9 million out of our budget just to be able to uh, make things work uh, in this current year. Um, you know, we had a, a successful override back in 2014 uh, that uh, allowed us to build back some things because conditions and, and resources had deteriorated to a point that was not acceptable to the community. Uh, we've been able to make it work in fits and starts since then, but we have had years where we've had to reduce, um, especially this year. And so this will allow us to incrementally add those things back um, over time and or invest in strategic priorities um, that are important to the school committee 
um, and uh, to the community because obviously your strategic plan uh, was was based on feedback uh, from the community itself. Um, a yes vote on question one uh, means success for our students next year. Uh, it allows us to add the 32.6 full-time equivalent staff to relieve that elementary overcrowding, provide full day K for all, and open the new Beale School as planned. Um, it also would keep all of our current positions in programming. It would also allow us, based on uh, the, the budget projection with a yes vote on the override, to add four teaching positions that we had to cut this year back. Two fifth grade positions, uh, which will help with class size at Sherwood, um, and two uh, teaching positions at the high school as well uh, that will help us to, to maintain class size uh, or add back or make sure we can have the right kind of electives uh, and, and other classes uh, that students need to have access to. Um, unfortunately, you know, if the opposite happens and question one fails, um, there'll be a failure to provide for our students next year. Um, our plan right now is to cut $2.94 million in almost 50 positions out of the budget uh, based on the, the, the budget gap that we have right now. Um, it would not allow us to open the new Beale School as planned. It would result in significant increases in class sizes and less academic support for students. Um, if the override question fails, um, our plan uh, results in the closing of all elementary school library media centers. Um, you just saw what the media center is going to look like at the new Beale School, okay. uh, but regardless of whether it's in one of our older schools or one of our newer schools, uh, the library media center is, is really a hub of helping students build early literacy skills and research skills, uh, and uh, it, it would be uh, frankly uh, shameful uh, if we're in a situation where we can't provide those kinds of just basic expected kinds of services to our students. Um, and, and it pains me that this is a recommendation that, that I am making, um, but based on the amount of budget gap, it's one of the things that we feel we could just collectively reduce and hopefully restore at some point in the future. Uh, but uh, you know, really the goal, of course, is not to have to even go there. Um, it will result, in, re it will result uh, in budget cuts next year and reduction of special subject now at arts positions uh, that will result in less programming for grades K through 8 in those special subjects. Um, I also th think it's important to note uh, that if we have to make the level of cuts uh, that uh, are part of our reduction plan, uh, we will have high school students next year uh, who will not be able to get AP classes that they've registered for, uh, who will not be able to get elective classes that they've registered for. Uh, frankly, it will, it will result, in, and I am sensitive to this as, as the father of a rising senior uh, for next year, um, you know, that, those course selections are made with certain things in mind about how they're put together that jigsaw puzzle of their transcript. Um, and uh, it, it will certainly uh, be extremely disappointing to deliver the news to students and families that, you know, that AP course you were planning on taking is just not going to be offered because we don't have the personnel to do it uh, or that elective you were really counting on. Um, so this is, this is very, very serious uh, in terms of the level of compromise of quality um, and the potential to put our, our high school students, frankly, at a disadvantage uh, compared to students who are attending other high schools that are adequately funded in terms of access to AP courses or access to certain course electives, um, not to mention higher class size and the courses that continue to exist. So I've used this graphic before, and I, I, I show it to you again uh, because I don't think we can overstate that this we are facing as a school district an education emergency. Uh, but the fortunate thing is that there is a pathway forward for this community, thanks to the unanimous vote of the Board of Selectmen, to place this override question on the ballot um, so that the community can provide the funding that our school department needs um, to continue what we're doing, restore some of what we've lost, um, and make sure that we're moving forward in a way that the community expects. Um, so again, and this is language is from the resolution uh, that's drafted uh, that is before you this evening. Uh, if we do not have sufficient local revenue, uh, the school district will need to make major cuts to personnel and programming and will not be able to properly open the new Beale School, uh, which will severely compromise our school's ability to meet our students' needs at a critical time when they need our strong support. Uh, severely reducing our school's resources next year uh, are just going to compound these negative effects of the pandemic uh, on our students' well-being and their academic progress. Um, so it really is, you know, if there was ever a time that we want to make sure we're investing more in education, not less, um, it is coming out of this pandemic year and a half um, by the time we start uh, the next school year. Um, so it's critical 
Uh, I think a yes vote is critically important for this community. I think it would be a watershed uh, moment in the history of, of the town government in Shrewsbury. Um, it will provide our schools with the resources they need uh, to ensure that our town's children receive an excellent education um, and also provide certainly a level of stability and, and the ability to improve to our municipal partners as well in those departments. Um, so with that, uh, that's a, an overview for those who want to understand uh, what is at stake here uh, and that uh, want to be sure people are aware that this override question exists. You know, we're not able to, based on campaign finance law, uh, push out specific information about this. It's, uh, you know, these, all this information will be available on our website. Uh, but uh, you know, it's important that when people are watching these meetings that they are spreading this information to one another uh, because just based on the way things work, uh, we're not able to provide some of the specific information in a format as we typically would for other kinds of communications from the school district. Uh, so with that, it would be my recommendation that the school committee uh, vote to adopt this resolution that's before you. Um, I know the school committee has done an incredible amount of work uh, uh, working to advocate uh, for what our school district needs and to partner with the Board of Selectmen um, in this very innovative and fiscally responsible solution. Uh, and certainly, as to your superintendent, I, I cannot overstate uh, how critically important this is for the future of the Shrewsbury Public Schools. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. And before we go to questions or comments, I would just um, ask Mr. Collins if you could comment on stimulus funds quickly for anybody who might be watching for the first time that this is not a um, this is not going to get us out of this budget gap. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, at your last meeting, we provided uh, a very detailed update that uh, report on all the amounts of federal stimulus funding um, uh, that have been received directly by the school department and uh, how the vast majority of that funding already received has been either spent or committed. Um, and the intent of this stimulus funding is to provide uh, time limited um, uh, one-time uh, uh, funding to deal with the pandemic expenses because if that funding had not been provided we would otherwise have to go back to the town meeting and ask for additional resources to deal with all the associated pandemic costs like the surveillance testing program that was referenced earlier uh, all the personal protective equipment uh, additional staffing and nursing support uh, to manage through uh, the pandemic along with additional furnishings so uh, the stimulus funding has provided great relief, um, and, uh, but however, it is uh, intended to be one-time funding mm -hmm. and uh, not to be relied upon to solve our uh, structural deficit uh, dilemma that we're facing, that really only solution to that is an operational override. Um, so hopefully that suffices in terms of what mm -hmm. you're asking. Thank you. Any questions or comments, Jason? I do have comments, but actually before, so Mrs. Fritz, not to put you on, on the spot, but I'm wondering if you might actually comment as chair on some of the work that this committee has done with the Board of Selectmen, and in particular a little bit on the agreement that the, the two uh, panels reached and, and, and what that means for the coming few years. Because sure, I think that's important uh, background information for folks Absolutely. who might be watching. And I think I'll step back even further. Um, as the two boards, we've actually been working well over a year, started last February in what we're calling 2-2 meetings. We've been working to Board of Selectmen, to school committee members, along with Dr. Sawyer, Mr. Collins, and Mr. Mizakar, uh, talking about budget issues. And even the fact that we thought even last year that an override was on the horizon because uh, of budget issues the school department was having. Uh, we had a reduction of 1.9 million, almost 30 positions last year. So we've been continually working at this, really started in earnest in January, knowing that we were going to be having a significant budget gap. We've actually been almost meeting weekly with this 2-2 group. Um, some of those discussions were difficult discussions. Uh, so we looked at what was the uh, position of the Board of Selectmen going forward. And I think we have had an excellent partnership with them. We have reached a position of what we're calling um, a commitment to the community. And our commitment is that it, um, after Mr. Mizakar had presented what we're calling, it's an override stabilization model. It's a short and a long-term solution. The um, short term is we're able to fill this gap that we have 
and we will have um, the ability to maintain and or improve municipal and educational services. But we also are committing to the residents that we will not ask for another override for a four year period. There is a um, commitment to only have a certain amount of expenditure for the schools, for the municipal during that four year period. And I think it provides reliable, stable and predictable budgeting for the community. And um, it also begins, which I think is the most important part, is working on the structural deficit that has been affecting this community for years. Um, all communities have structural deficits. So, you know, expenses tend to outpace revenue. But we've been dealing with a very large and deepening structural deficit. And the model that's before us is something that will help us get out of it. And it is a commitment from the two policymaking boards in the community to the taxpayers that we are committed to solving it and that we are not going to ask for anything for a four year period, but we are able to work within a, a budget that will solve issues. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna, uh, just, go, just to offer some, some comments on the resolution. I'm, I'm strongly in support of the resolution. Um, Shrewsbury needs additional revenues in order to maintain the services that residents have come to expect. The town needs this in order to maintain the type of community that residents have come to know and love and expect. Property taxes are the fact of life in every Massachusetts municipality. In New England, there's a tradition of funding a lot of local government on the property tax. Shrewsbury has the lowest residential property tax rate of any municipality that touches us. And should this override pass, that will still be the case. Are there municipalities with lower property tax rates in the state? Sure. They don't offer the type of services that Shrewsbury offers. They are not the type of community that Shrewsbury residents have come to expect. This community had a low or relatively low tax levy in fiscal 1982 when Prop 2 and a half took effect. We got locked in where we were. New growth in the 80s and 90s covered the problem, but we've been paying for it in fits and starts for the last 20 years. And if Shrewsbury residents want to continue with the quality of educational and municipal services we've come to enjoy, this is what's necessary to do so. Uh, uh, to me, uh, this obviously has particular relevance uh, to our school department, to all of us as school committee members, it has particular relevance to our school department, this resolution before us. Is a vote we take as school committee members. Obviously, our primary charge is to look out for the quality of the educational program, and we know that this override is important for the success of our public schools. But as Ms. Fritz just alluded to in talking about the agreement with the Board of Selectmen, it is important to note this is not a school only override. This is something that's going to help our municipal services as well. This is something that has a town wide benefit. It will benefit our youngest citizens, it will benefit our most senior residents. I think it is the right thing for Shrewsbury Public Schools. I think it is the right thing for the community that uh, I have lived in most of my life, and uh, I am pleased to support this resolution. Thank you. Dale? I support the resolution as well uh, for all of the reasons uh, that Mr. Palish listed. I think that this is not a nice to have. It is, it is maintaining what we have. We will lose too much if it does not pass, so it is averting a disaster. It doesn't just put out the fire in front of us, though, it is structured differently than the previous override was. It puts in place this uh, uh, fund to keep things sustainable. It gives us the tool to look forward a year or two and to predict when we may need another override and assure that we're at least maintaining services as we go forward and we don't put in place something that is, uh, precipitates these crises. We shouldn't be in this crisis that we're in today. And we need to not only put out the fire, but build a stronger house. That's what this uh, override plan does. And that is why I support it. And also, just as Mr. Palish said, uh, it is affordable. Uh, it's really hard to define what affordable is, but the fact is, is our tax rate is, is lower and it's going to stay lower than everyone around us uh, even after the override. And so it is, it is by no stretch of the imagination uh, an extravagant ask at all. So I strongly support this. Thank you. 
John. Yeah, I support the resolution as well. Um, it, I agree with Dr. Suarez. This is a watershed moment for Shrewsbury. Um, this will determine the fiscal trajectory of all town services, both municipal and educational. Um, we've, we've seen 15 years of fiscal studies that point to a structural deficit in this town. At some point, you know, something's got to give. Um, I, I do think this override framework that we've agreed to with the Board of Selectmen is a game changer, uh, no doubt. I think it's what differentiates what uh, the successful uh, 2014 override, in addition to the fact that today the consequences are more dire than they were seven years ago, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, it took, it took many months of discussion with cross-functional teams to get to this point. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to thank the Board of Selectmen uh, along with uh, town manager Mizikar, um, certainly the finance committee, you know, it unanimously supported to get this on the ballot uh, and let the citizens decide, um, which I think is sig significant. Uh, so thank you to all involved to get, mm -hmm. for getting to this point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it was not a rash decision. There was a lot of time and effort and thought because we do understand for some that it it may not be an easy financial decision for them, but the commitment to the residents does provide mitigation uh, for those who may struggle with the ability to potentially pay that additional dollars. So there is some mitigation for them within that commitment. Um, so we did make sure that we are being conscious of somebody who is having some issues with paying that. But as Jason said, if you look at the surrounding communities, even with the increase, we still remain lower. And again, there is always a cost to doing business there. If, if you're going to have school and municipal services, there is a cost to those. So we have to be willing to pay for what we expect the town to provide. Um, and I do believe that the community will support these additional uh, services that they want. Um, this is a different time from 2014. I do think looking at what we stand to lose, I think it is almost worse. Um, we're immediately going to have significant class sizes, reduction in educational services across the board. Um, it, it, this is not something that we want to have happen. And again, this is... Um, this is not an issue we're seeing across other communities. This is very much a Shrewsbury problem with a deep structural deficit issue that we're dealing with. So I do fully support this. I do believe that the community will support this. This is a strong economic financial um, package that Mr. Mizakar has brought forward. There's been a lot of time and effort put into this. I hope that everybody who is listening takes time to look at the information that is on the town manager's website, on the school committee's website. There's a lot of information out there, but um, this is a short and long-term solution as we move forward. Anything further, Dr. Sawyer or Mr. Collins? No, I, I deeply appreciate the strong support of the school committee and uh, the board of selectmen and uh, the finance committee, I believe, also voted in yes, they to did. support this as yep. well. I will be meeting with them on Saturday morning at approximately just around 9.15 in the morning um, to present to them uh, as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, as, as both a, you know, the, in my professional role as superintendent and, and as a resident of the community, I think this is much needed. Uh, I mean, we'll do a lot to, to maintain the quality of life here in, in, the, in the town that uh, so many of us uh, feel so deeply for. And I, I think before we vote, I think the other piece that as a school committee member that really bothers me, seeing that new school that we had the opportunity to walk through and being part of, you know, the committee to try to get that vote passed. You know, we promised this brand new school, full day kindergarten for all, and the possibility of not opening a school. I mean, we've never had that. I think that is another piece that is just really hard to even bring to the community. So again, lots, we have a lot to lose if this does not pass for a lot of individuals throughout the community. So, okay. So the motion is that the school committee vote to support the, I need my glasses tonight, hold on. Motion that the school committee vote to support the proposed resolution in favor of the operational override question, question one on the May 4th 2021 annual town election ballot. So moved. Second. 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 
Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Next, we are going to talk about fees and tuitions for the 2021-2022 school year. And at our meeting on March 24th, Mr. Collins and Dr. Sawyer presented information on fees related to transportation, athletics activities. And uh, tonight, and along with full day kindergarten and preschool tuition, and tonight Dr. Sawyer will make his recommendation. Thank you. And there's a memorandum in your packet uh, from me uh, and uh, essentially, uh, just given what we just discussed, uh, that families will be are being asked to increase their local property tax through the proposed operational override question. Um, I, I don't believe it would be wise to also ask for an increase uh, in fees or tuitions. Um, and as such, my recommendation for the next fiscal year, uh, starting July 1st, the next school year, the 2021-2022 school year, uh, that fees and tuitions are, are maintained at the rates that were originally established for fiscal year 2021. Prior to the pandemic, and we made some adjustments this year because of the circumstances of the pandemic, but these would be the last set of uh, uh, fees and tuitions accrued uh, for, the, uh, for the school district. Um, with one exception, um, and that would be to uh, eliminate the tuition for full-day kindergarten to follow through on the uh, promise that the school committee made to the uh, community that when the new Beale school opened and, and you know in anticipation of this uh, we've been stepping down the level of that tuition over time so that we would not have a fiscal cliff uh, when we got to this point and that's something that you know, Mr. Collins had the foresight a number of years ago to begin planning for that and the school committee has supported that um, however if the operational override were to fail at the ballot uh, which I don't think it will but if it were to uh, I believe then at that point it would be wise for the school community to revisit that uh, to see whether some level of tuition might be uh, required to avoid uh, some of these uh, deep budget cuts that would be required uh, if there were a, vote, a no vote. Um, so just to summarize briefly, uh, the rates that were set for fiscal year 2021, the transportation fee is at $320 per student for those who are required to pay a fee uh, with a family cap uh, of three uh, total bus fees and a late fee of $50 per student, also with a family cap of three late fees. Uh, for the athletic fee, that would be $325 per sport per season with a family cap of no more than three total athletic fees uh, for the same family. Uh, would stay in effect, it would be $100 per sport at Oak uh, with again a family cap of no more than three per family per year uh, and a late fee of $50 for each uh, high school registration that's late and $25 late fee for Oak. Um, beyond the established deadlines for those seasons. Uh, for the activity fees, those are set at $110 uh, and at the high school, $75 for Oak Middle School, and $55 for Sherwood Middle School. Um, by paying an activity fee, you're able to access as many activities as you participate in that year. It's kind of a one-stop, uh, a one-fee for access. Um, our music lesson program, uh, these were adjusted uh, the previous fiscal year as well by the school committee. Uh, they would be maintained at uh, for one semester of 14 30-minute lessons at $426, uh, a semester of 14 45-minute lessons at $617, and a semester of 14 60-minute lessons would be $809, also a $50 late fee uh, based on their schedule. Our preschool tuition uh, would also uh, was adjusted last year, would remain the same. Uh, it would be for a two half day program, $2,239 per year. Uh, for three half days, $2,910. For four half days, $3,507. And for a five half day program, $4,292. There is a $100 non refundable registration fee. We will continue to use the Massachusetts Department of Early Education and Care uh, medium income uh, chart for, to provide financial assistance eligibility or to determine it. Uh, we would continue the 10% sibling discount, uh, and there would be a $25 late fee uh, for their uh, late monthly payment. Uh, Full-day kindergarten tuition would be eliminated, um, and full-day kindergarten would be provided for all students with no tuition required. And then finally, extended school care tuition, which was also adjusted uh, the previous fiscal year. Um, that would be for uh, before school care, uh, for two days, $56, three days, $82, four days, $112, five days a week, $138, and for after-school care at two days, 122 
three days a week, $184, four days a week at $244, and five days per week at $306. There is a $20 non-refundable registration fee at $25 fee. Additionally, for each early release day for the additional time, and typically we have to bring them off campus to a field trip when those times return uh, because students are training on site those days, and then a $25 late fee for a late monthly payment. And financial assistance eligibility for extended school care is based on uh, student subsidized lunch eligibility. Um, so that is a summary of what they would be, uh, and those are my recommendations, and I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee has. Any questions or comments? Nope. All right. May have a motion that the committee vote to approve the fee and tuition rates for fiscal year 2022 as illustrated in the superintendent's recommendation memo. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Next, Dr. Sawyer will provide an update on the Assabet Valley Collaborative. Thank you. Pull my materials up here. One moment. Okay, so the Aspect Valley Collaborative uh, is uh, an organization that the uh, Shrewsbury Public Schools uh, is a member of uh, that uh, began uh, in, uh, I believe it was 1976, uh, or it was, in the 19, it was in the 1970s, I know. Uh, and essentially, it was a group of local school districts that uh, entered into a formal agreement together to provide uh, services that otherwise individual districts might have trouble providing given the economy of scale uh, at a, at a uh, cost-effective way on their own. In addition to that, and those are typically special education services, in addition to that it functions as a professional organization where uh, superintendents interact with other superintendents, uh, those of job-alike groups at the district level, whether that's a human resources director or a assistant superintendent for finance, uh, are able to interact with their counterparts in these other local districts. Um, and it's been uh, a very successful arrangement for the school district for a long period of time. Um, in your materials, uh, you will find uh, that there is the annual report. Under state law, the annual report needs to be provided each year um, to the uh, uh, each school committee of each member district. Uh, for those who are interested, the member districts, uh, and this is in alphabetical order, include the Aspect Valley Regional Vocational Technical District, Auburn Public Schools, uh, Berlin Boylston Public Schools, the Grafton Public Schools, Hudson Public Schools, Marlboro Public Schools, Maynard Public Schools, Millbury Public Schools, Neshoba Regional Public Schools, Northboro Southboro Public Schools, and Westboro Public Schools, along with uh, our own district here in Shrewsbury. Um, and it was 1976. Uh, that was the original date uh, of the of the uh, collaborative. Uh, in terms of uh, what what's inside in the and this will be posted on our website as all the materials for the tonight's meeting will be under the school committee uh, section of our website. Um, there are a variety of benefits from membership um, in terms of uh, volume purchasing, for example, uh, or, or whether that could be in uh, accessing uh, specialized special education programming. Uh, just, uh, I uh, know Dr. McGee had asked me this question. Um, in the various programs right now, we have uh, about 17 students uh, who are in uh, programs. We have two in what's known as their REACH program, which is for students with, uh, who are typically medically fragile and require very specialized services. Uh, we have two in the uh, what's known as Orchard Street Academy, which is a uh, middle school, high school program uh, that's based in Marlboro. Uh, where students who may have some significant uh, emotional or behavioral difficulties uh, would go in a, uh, to school in a therapeutic setting. Um, we do it, they have a program called SOAR, which is an evaluation program. We had one student enrolled in that at one point this year before that student was transitioned to an out-of-district placement. Um, and then we have uh, the program we have the most students in is the evolution program, uh, which is uh, for this year uh, housed at Shrewsbury High School in a space we converted a number of years ago. Um, we're actually going to be reclaiming that space, and Evolution is actually moving to the Marlboro headquarters of the collaborative next year. Uh, but these are for students who are uh, between, between the ages of 18 and 22 years old um, who require special education services until they turn age 22. Um, and it's essentially it's a post-high school uh, transitional kind of program that helps prepare students uh, for uh, opportunities uh, beyond 
uh, uh, their K-12 their and beyond education, uh, which could be oftentimes vocational kinds of skills, um, as well as uh, sometimes there are students who are preparing for community college opportunities, um, and, and, but that's, a, that's where we have our largest number of students participating. Uh, we also access some contracted services. So we contract with, um, actually uh, many know here in the local community, Dr. Kim Kuziak, who's a child psychiatrist, who provides some uh, uh, opportunities for doing clinical rounds and also helps teach a parenting strategies workshop that we contract with her for through the collaborative. Um, and other, other districts access her through the collaborative as well. Uh, and we also uh, are able to uh, get a substantial savings on transportation for out-of-district students in specialized placements. Um, and so we have, uh, uh, tip in a typical year, we have about 30-plus students who are riding uh, different routes and, and uh, uh, Aspen Valley Collaborative contracts with a company called Vanpool. Uh, so people may see when they're driving around the community or on the highways, you may see uh, uh, school bus vans uh, that are, are labeled with the Van Poole uh, uh, name. Uh, those often are transporting students from the central Massachusetts area, including Shrewsbury, um, to specialized day school placements uh, all around the area. Um, and as a result of sort of the, the bulk purchasing of a service like that, uh, we're able to save uh, money uh, versus what it would be if each district were contracting that on their own. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, some contractual arrangements for bulk purchasing for things like paper, uh, office supplies, things of that nature, where, again, we get volume discounts because all of these districts are pooling themselves uh, together through the collaborative. Um, so there's a lot of benefit uh, to that as well. Um, so those are some, uh, just to give people a sense of, of uh, what the collaborative is providing to us. Uh, there's a lot of other information, uh, you know, about these programs in the annual report. And then finally, also uh, uh, passed along uh, from uh, Dr. Kathy Cummins, the executive director of the collaborative. Um, and it's been a very stable organization in that Dr. Cummins has been there uh, about, I think, about, uh, about as long as I've been superintendent here in Shrewsbury, so a dozen plus years. Uh, and uh, she did send along a, a memo uh, to uh, the member school committees uh, to make them aware. Uh, there is a, uh, a situation where um, a collaborative, uh, and there are multiple collaboratives around the, around the state. Assabet is the local collaborative we belong to, but there are others in all other parts of, of uh, across the state of Massachusetts. Um, and it's important that uh, uh, people realize that uh, there's a collaborative that's known as the EDCO Collaborative, uh, that actually has become defunct, um, and uh, because they are dissolving, uh, unfortunately, they, they have red ink, uh, and as a result, their member school districts actually have to uh, pay money um, in, as part of their collaborative agreement to, to settle the debts that that uh, collaborative is, is in. Um, and uh, although it's, I think it may have been some local news sources, I don't, I don't think it's been publicized a lot at this point, uh, but Dr. Cummins wanted to be sure that uh, uh, the member school committees knew um, that, you know, Aspen Valley Collaborative is on solid financial footing. She cites a variety of uh, reasons why uh, that's the case. Uh, I can say, you know, the superintendents of the member districts serve as the board of directors, and uh, the collaborative has been very transparent, uh, frequently updates us on their financial situation. Um, it is not a collaborative that has debt, uh, and uh, there's a lot of stability right now in terms of its, uh, its programming and its, and its finances. So I uh, wanted to be sure that the committee was aware of that as well. Um, so that is the uh, update regarding our membership in the collaborative, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee has. Any questions or comments for Dr. Sawyer? We, just very quickly, we have roughly 70, 75 out-of-district placements. Is that correct? Right. About, yep. And are our students who are at the Asabet Collaborative, they're in, included in that 70, yes. uh, 75? Right. So that, that would actually represent half or more than half of maybe half of the students who are out of district placements, counting the... Uh, well, the, the total is about uh, 17, so about 17 students out 17? of the... 17? Uh, okay. Yeah, so, so there's 13 right, at Evolution, there were more two in each the, at OSA uh, and REACH. Yeah. Uh, SOAR program, okay. okay. Anything else? No? Nope. Okay. All right, I'll sit on that. I'm sorry, you're probably adding the, the transportation, which some of that is the same students might be being transported and then... then Okay. Assabet Valley Collaborative is also transporting kids who are going to other kind of schools. Places, okay. So that's where it gets a little confusing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next, we have our minutes from our meeting uh, meetings on 
March 10th and March 24th, 2021. 2021. Are there any changes or corrections? There being none, those can be marked as accepted as distributed. Okay, we do need to go into executive session this evening for the purpose of addressing Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A7, to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements, Purpose 7, Open Meeting Law, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30. A, Section 22 FG, for the purpose of reviewing, approving, and or releasing executive session minutes. B, for the purpose of addressing Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30 A, Section 21 A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect of the bargaining or litigating position of the public body, and the chair so declares, purpose three, the Shrewsbury Education Association's units A and or B, the Shrewsbury Paraprofessional Association, and or the cafeteria workers, and C, for the purpose of addressing Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel and, and excuse me, non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, Purpose 2, non-represented administrators where deliberation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and we will return to open session only for the purpose of adjourning for the evening. May I have a motion that we adjourn to executive session? So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call vote is required. Mr. Palich. Aye. Dr. McGee. Aye. Mr. Wensky. Aye. Myself. Aye. Thank you and good night. <laughs>